applies particularly in flood events. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, I remember the first couple days getting out on the ground in, in some of the areas in southern southwest part of this province and, and being amazed and astonished and you'll see some of the pictures that, uh, that I have here. So the first thing that I wanted to do is, is put you know, it into context what we're dealing with here as, as, as a province and uh, you know, it, like I said, you know, I remember going the day, the, sort of before the flood, I, I drive my wife into work every, every day from downtown and we come through Center Street and I remember being up late doing some work that night and just hearing the rain come down constantly, not just the downpour. You know, I think it started about, you know, midnight or shortly afterwards. And, and I remember driving my wife into work, going over the Center Street Bridge, seeing the river, and going, wow. Particularly if we're getting a lot of water coming off the snowpack, I said, you know, this could be some serious flooding that, that happens over the next couple of days. So, and, and we all know how that turned out. So, on uh, June 23rd, uh, 27 local states of emergency were declared uh, uh, in the province. Um, and uh, so just to give you the scope, the scope of that, that so 27 uh, municipalities declared uh, uh, local states of emergency. In the first 60 days after the floods in High River, 1,500 truckloads of debris were moved from residential areas, 1.8 billion gallons of water pumped out of the town. Um, infrastructure, close to 1,000 kilometers of highways were closed as a result of the flood. 30 bridges were damaged, uh, uh, experienced significant damage. 23 or 32 schools were impacted in some way or another by the flooding. Uh, I know what one of the schools here in Calgary uh, that was impacted by the Elbow River, they had to open the front doors and the back doors to let the river go through the school so that it wouldn't take the school with it. Uh, so uh, just very significant and obviously a lot of our, our, our more remote areas, places where people go recreate on weekends and over the summer, like Kananaskis is experiencing significant damage as well. Um, this is a picture that I found. Uh, one of my favorite places in the world to visit is Venice. That looks like Venice to me, not Calgary. Uh, so I found uh, that, that quite interesting. Um, uh, this is out in uh, the Turner Valley Black Diamond area. The uh, bridge there on the bottom left completely wiped out. It's amazing they build those uh, guards stronger than the actual bridge. Um, but uh, you can see part of the, the road between Turner Valley and Black Diamond up there uh, was eroded. Um, the cost. Um, one of the things is, is, you know, preliminary estimates are pegging the cost of this flood at $6 billion. Uh, to put that into context, the Slave Lake fires in 2011 were about a billion dollars. What makes this different is, is that a lot of the costs uh, for uh, flooding here, and we'll talk about that later, is uninsurable uh, um, losses. Overland flooding is uh, uh, not uh, an insurable uh, coverage provided in Canada, and, and, and that makes it significant. For example, in Slave Lake, of approximately that $1 billion, I think it's just slightly over $1 billion, 700,000 of that, so close to 70%, was covered by insurance companies, but covered by insurance policies. So the, the rest of the, the tab was picked up under the disaster recovery program by the province or, or the federal government. And uh, whereas in Alberta, because most of it is uninsurable, uh, only about 1.7 billion of the $6 billion is being estimated as being covered. And, and uh, the federal governments and the provincial governments will then be hooked on, on the balance of that. Uh, one of the things is, as a, as a percentage of GDP, it's close to uh, uh, just about 1% of, uh, of uh, Alberta's GDP and about 0.02% of the uh, GDP in, in Canada, which is a little bit slightly lower than uh, the impact of Hurricane Katrina in the U.S., was, which was about 1% uh, 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 GDP. Um, uh, the flood, just the extent of uh, the ministries involved, uh, there, and I'll get uh, to the Flood Recovery Task Force later, but these are the departments that were identified as having to be part of the Flood Recovery Task Force. And the truth is, is you could actually, you could see that education and advanced education aren't in there. Uh, the, the fact is, as I said, 32 schools as well as a number of post-secondary institutions uh, experienced damage as well. Um, just want to talk briefly about some of the things that you know you should think about as as I go through through this presentation, and uh, you know part of what you know I, uh, JS asked me to come talk about here today was about you know sort of on the fly, real world policy making, 
Uh, and, uh, and that's what you know our job is to do is you know we're uh, particularly in this circumstance is that the timelines are tight and we were you know at, we're asked to make decisions in a very uh, fast-paced env environment and which is usually a lot different than than the way most policy development happens um, <clears throat> what I what I always call is the the, uh, the policy uh, analyst axiom and for me, for my, in my business, as, as an elected person, as a politician, there's, there's a truth that, it, and I, I'm sure my staff gets tired of me saying this, is that there's a truth to everything that I do. And what we do is we balance good policy with good politics. And, and a great example of this is, is, and I know that this is something that the School of Public Policy has put a, a, done a lot of research on, is the tax regime here in this province. And I know that there's been many reports around, you know, maybe moving from an income, uh, an income tax system to uh, a sales tax system. And, and I think, you know, and I've read a lot of those reports, and there's definitely some, some policy merit to that. And, and uh, you know, any person that, you know, wants to sit down and have a peer policy debate, you know, would probably might lean towards that side. But there's a political reality to implementing uh, that policy. And, and so that's one of the lens that, you know, I would like you to look through. This and I'll, I'll bring up a numerous examples. Is is you know and, and at times we you know we do make decisions that we know that are just good policy makes sense decisions, uh, but bad politics and, and you'll see how that that plays out over over this. Um, uh, there's the politics of disasters that actually you know plays a little bit into this. You know certainly and we'll talk about this a, a, a bit, but um, um, I find uh, it, it's very interesting. Particularly if a politician handles the flood er, really well early, they get a big boost of popularity, uh, and uh, and then later on, usually they're you know as they have to then start making tough decisions from that, that you know they usually see a decline. What I find real interesting is is that for the most part, politicians, dis, uh, decision makers, uh, as part of that initial response, really don't have much of a large say in what's going on outside of, of, of being maybe the top communicator. A lot of the decisions that are happening really, really fast are being ha are made on the ground by first responders, by people that have been put in place uh, in Alberta through the emergent, Alberta Emergency Management uh, Agency or local uh, uh, emergency centers. And uh, so what, what's always interesting is the success of those, those emergency operations are mo mostly contingent actually on on years and years of planning, uh, policy decisions, and allocation of resources. And quite frankly, usually most of the leaders, the politicians that are in those positions, actually have really had very little to do with, with, with that. It's the, their predecessors that have made the decisions that allow them to be successful in those circumstances. So that's a, certainly an, a very interesting thing to consider. Um, and then one of the, the, the uh, lenses that you need to look at is, you know, a typical policy development process. And, and here we have, you know, a, a couple sort of, you know, processes that have been, that been set out. I just pulled this off of Wikipedia, but, you know, identifying the issue, doing the analysis, uh, developing, you know, your instrument options, doing consultations with your stakeholders. Well, what we had to do here was truncate all of that, and in many cases, we were announcing policies publicly so we could get that out there, getting then getting feedback, then having to go back and readjust our policies. Uh, and uh, in many cases, and again, we'll go through that, you'll see examples of that. Uh, you'll see here, ministerial working groups, deputy minister pods, operations committee, treasury board, regional caucuses and full caucuses. Most policy decisions go through all of those stages uh, before they're actually uh, uh, finally approved and, and announced publicly. Uh, the Flood Recovery Task Force was created to create a single body of, of ministers uh, uh, that, are, that, I, that I mentioned earlier um, <clears throat> to make decisions. And uh, uh, while Treasury Board still has to make decisions on allocation of funding, uh, th there was very broad direction given by Treasury Board uh, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that around how that fund money could be allocated by the, the, the task force. So there's a lot of authority and decision-making power handed over to the uh, Flood Recovery Task Force. Uh, <clears throat> the, other the other lens is, uh, this is sort of the disaster recovery phases. And, and this is how I'm going to put the context of how decisions are made to get us through these phases. And so there's the initial response, 
where the main objectives are uh, they're focusing on saving life and land and property and infrastructure protection. Uh, again, you know, that's not the stuff that is the policies that are, are made at, at the, those, that's, uh, that's a lot of on the ground work and, and policies that have been created uh, uh, for many, many years or decades before. Stabilization, it's a restoration of essential services uh, and uh, starting to do the damage assessment. Uh, evacuation, uh, the immediate recovery is when evacuation orders are lifted, uh, cleanup starts to begin, and then we have the, the long-term recovery, which is to get the community, communities that are impacted back to self-sustainability and to uh, uh, look at, you know, how do we prevent uh, these and make communities more resilient uh, uh, moving forward. So, so these are uh, <clears throat> response, uh, uh, the, for the, the response area of the, the recovery cycle. Uh, policies and decisions. So uh, I think we all are going to, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, people are going to go, where were you during the floods of 2013? Do you remember uh, remember that? And uh, for many people, this is where they were. And uh, I can tell you that the stories uh, around the heroes and the misery and suffering were, were outrageous. I think we all know, I mean, I think we all remember this picture. That picture became very famous. <laughs> I don't know what was going on there, but I uh, it definitely, I think, provided some uh, comic relief during what were very tragic and intense times. You know, our first responders did a, a, a fantastic job. Uh, the fact that there was only four casualties, uh, considering that uh, the number of casualties, uh, we evacuated over 100 residents. Uh, if you take the, the floods in, in Colorado, they only evacuated about 10,000 residents and there were double the amount of casualties. Uh, so, they did a fantastic job. I remember this, this was shortly after I was appointed minister, we were doing a press conference. I don't know if it caught a lot of media, but uh, this little boy here, uh, again, a little bit of comedy relief uh, during very tragic, intense times, uh, had heard that there were a lot of people in trouble during the floods on the news. So he wore a Superman suit for two days straight so he could help people. Um, and so it was uh, uh, definitely an interesting time in the history of our province. Um, just to give you some context from a policy standpoint about some of the policies and decisions that are impact that, you know, that sort of first, that first phase. First of all, uh, there was a Gronevelt report, a report that was commissioned after the floods in 2005 uh, that was chaired by MLA uh, Gronevelt from the Highwood constituency. Uh, and, and so that sort of set the stage of, you know, how prepared we were, you know, what were the recommendation, policy recommendations coming out of 05 that helped us, uh, as well as then you start to see again the politics of disaster, you know, certainly criticism about whether all, all, all the recommendations were implemented, whether they were acted on faster. Essentially there was 18 recommendations, uh, three were sort of had to do with uh, uh, maps uh, and, and, and doing appropriate flood, flood risk mapping, and we'll talk about that later. Five were around collecting better, better data and making that available, uh, three were around uh, Flood risk, flood risk, identifying flood the flood risk areas uh, and um, and disclosing those to, to people in the municipalities. Um, four were around what I would call mitigation best practices and strategies to prevent uh, uh, future uh, future flooding. Two were around uh, uh, changing or putting some restrictions on the disaster recovery program. Uh, and uh, again, we talked. About, I'll talk about that a bit later. And finally, the last, the last one was that the report completely rejected the idea of having the overland flood insurance in Canada. Uh, so uh, that that's the context of where we're coming from from a policy uh, standpoint and how it impacts uh, it. Uh, the Gronovelt part was good. You know, certainly there's a lot of context around whether there's enough uh, policy and and re public resources in place to do weather prediction. Uh, I just came from a meeting the other day with a guy that's uh, been involved in this for the province for 40 years. Uh, the, the differences between these weather systems that come in and whether they turn into just your normal rainfall or something like this is very, very minuscule. He said the night of the floods, uh, 40 years in his working, in any of the places that got flooded, he would have been comfortable going home and going to bed that night. They get the, the storm that, was, that, that, that happened uh, was very much similar to the, the type of storm that happened in Colorado as well. Uh, but it happens, those weather conditions happen at least four or five times a year. 
most of the time it turns into nothing, just your average, you know, rainfall. But in the very rare circumstance, it turns into something like we experience. In fact, later on this year, on September 5th, there was a lot of concern that the actual weather report uh, for the September 5th and the forecast was exactly the same moving into the weekend that it was leading into to, to, to this flood event. And again, over the, the, the 24-hour period, stuff changed, stuff happened in the atmosphere or whatnot, and, and uh, that, uh, that forecast was then downgraded. So the challenge is, is how, 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 how much information do you put out uh, and how much information uh, uh, do you, uh, it, because it affects what people do. In Medicine Hat, they were told, uh, frankly, that to expect the worst to a point where they go, that's over and above what we've ever planned for, so we're just getting everything we possibly can out of there. It ended up not being that bad, so they could have spent more time sandbagging, which would have prevented for, uh, 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 less damage. So that's, that's the, the, challenge, the challenge that you play. And then there's always you know, the, the concept of cry wolf. If you tell people to evacuate 10 times, and every time it's, it doesn't turn out to be very serious, they stop listening to you, and when it's serious, uh, you have problems. So, um, <clears throat> So the, it, on June 20th, the emergency management operation issued the highest level of uh, alert uh, for the province ever seen in its history. Uh, there was mandatory evacuation orders issued by municipalities, like I said, close to 100,000 residents. Uh, certainly, it's a very dangerous circumstance when you get that much water and you start getting debris going down that water. And you'll see some pictures a little bit later as to why. Uh, and you know, that attributed to four, four casualties. Uh, and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the Southern Alberta uh, Recovery Task Force was created uh, in the very short aftermath uh, and one billion dollars was committed uh, as an initial payment from Treasury Board uh, for that task force to undergo the, the recovery and reconstruction process. And again, a lot of latitude given to, to the, the, the task force to allocate uh, that money. Um, <clears throat> just going back to the Gonerval report, one of the things that's very interesting is, is you know, I think you can debate from a policy standpoint whether those policies were implemented fast enough or, or not fast enough. There's certainly areas where if they would have been implemented faster, you know, we could have prevented stuff. But what we also know is, and I, you know, I met with the uh, one of the areas of focus, and on the front page of the the report is High River. High River was, or not High River, Okotoks was significantly impacted in the 2005 floods. I met with the mayor. Uh, about a week after the floods there, uh, very minimal damage. The, the, the recommendations from the report and the subsequent work that they did in Okotoks prevented uh, them from being significantly impacted uh, in this point in time. So moving on to the stabilization uh, uh, phase, uh, you go from that real chaos of the emergency situation to starting to realize that you got a, 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 a job to do. And so um, one of the things that was a major impact uh, uh, obviously, High River was probably the, the largest impacted community, and what we had to do was to go from a local state of emergency to a provincial state of emergency, which essentially suspends the ability of the municipality to make the decisions around the emergency situation and is taken over by the province. Uh, that was requested by the mayor probably, well, on uh, uh, June 28th, so about so just over a week after the, the, the flood sort of hit the town. Uh, and the purpose was was that this stabilization phase was not going well. Um, they got through, and, and there was it, it, this could be a very dangerous phase. You're still on the point where there's still a huge risk to people losing lives. Um, you know whether you're hooking up utilities, electrical utilities, and a bunch of water. Uh, you know obviously that's really dangerous. Uh, you start to have public health concerns with. With, with E. coli and, and, and those types of things. And what you really want to do in this phase is you need to get your essential services restored, you know, clean, fresh water for, uh, for drinking. Uh, you need to get you make sure your fire and emergency services are able to respond to any issues. And uh, uh, you need to get access, you, then you need to start getting the community access to go back in. Uh, and, and then you need to make sure that moving forward, that uh, the administration of the recovery has the support that they need. So there was a number of uh, challenges here. 
you know, again, I talk about the politics of, of uh, uh, disasters. We all know that, you know, how some things have played out with the actions of the RCMP. I, could, I, I know that those are very, very tough decisions. Uh, I'm not going to sit here because I have no idea whether RCMP were directed to go into people's house and, and take certain things. I don't know where those decisions were made, whether they were made by the RCMP or whatever. I was, however, privy to conversations around some of the challenges in the stabilization phase of having people that were still in their houses and needing to get them out so that they can ensure that these to do the restoration of essential <coughs> services that they weren't that they weren't being distracted by people who might put themselves in harm's way because they're still in their houses. So what was what was happening is the fire department and volunteers through the local emergency operation were going door to door and they were being frankly threatened at the door by homeowners. Uh, uh, some were actually physically assaulted uh, because they didn't want to leave their house. And, uh, and that's when the RCMP were, were, were called in to actually do that work instead of volunteers and firefighters who are not used to handling those types of volatile situations. And so, and so you know, we ended up someplace where you know, we'll take a look at that and see how that happened. But the original intent of why you made that decision is grounded in trying to make sure we get we can get this stabilization uh, phase um, uh, solidified. Um, one of the other uh, decisions that we made was to issue um, uh, emergency financial services for those that have been uh, impacted by the by the flood. The uh, so there were uh, a number of preload what we call what were called preloaded debit cards. There's about uh, 1,250 uh, for per adult and 500 per children. The requirements were that you lived in a community or your house resided in a, in a community that was issued a mandatory evacuation order and that you were evacuated from your house uh, because of that evacuation order or because of damage to your house and you could not get back in for uh, up to eight, uh, eight consecutive days. Um, and uh, the, the big challenge is, is, you know, we rolled these out, uh, the, the technology that you use, we had to get it up from the U.S. Uh, to, to process these. Uh, we processed a number of them and you'll see some stats a little bit later. Um, this was delivered by the Department of Human Services who has expertise in delivering these types of income uh, uh, supplements and supports. You know, the challenge is how do you get it out in a timely manner for people that need it? Uh, the logistics of, you know, not have, getting them out to the various communities, you know, which communities need them first, which, which communities can wait, uh, those types of things. And then there's always the accountability issue. And uh, um, we, again, the timeliness, we didn't have a, a to, to get them out fast, we didn't have the ability to put in a, an accountability mechanism to make sure that people that were coming in were actually the ones that were eligible for them and met the criteria. So they signed a statutory declaration saying they understand what the criteria is and uh, that they meet uh, that criteria. I think later on this program will be audited likely by the Auditor General or maybe some sort of internal audit and, and certainly you know there probably will be some sort of element of, 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 of fraud but we believe that it's, it's, it's very likely to be a very small percentage but uh, we went, again we'll do the audit uh, sometime in the future to figure it out. It's, it, and this is really the sort of policy making delivery of public services on the fly where you, you get in that position where you, you have to make, you make that choice between um, a, uh, timeliness and, and uh, putting in appropriate accountability checks. Uh, <clears throat> so moving into the immediate recovery phase, what policies and, and decisions uh, were needed to be made, uh, question is where do you even start, right? Well, where we start is with the disaster recovery program. And the disaster recovery program uh, are uh, basically a safety net for citizens who include uninsurable losses and damage during a disaster. Uh, and as I mentioned, overland flood insurance is not provided in Canada. So it would, uh, 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 damages resulted from a disaster as a result of overland flooding uh, are eligible for disaster recovery claims. Uh, the program is a cost share program between the provincial government and the federal government. Ensures that costs associated with damages uh, are, uh, are shared by provinces. Uh, and in some cases by the entire country. So it is taxpayers' money. We're all paying for it through, through uh, uh, our tax money. Uh, and uh, in fact, all Canadians are. 
because we will be uh, receiving money from the, the federal government. And essentially, this is a very important part. Uh, the, the, the premise of the disaster recovery program is to return essential property. So that's key, essential property, you know. And, and again, that's tough. We might have all, all, uh, all sorts of definitions as to what property is essential. Uh, but uh, that, those, those uh, guidelines have been worked out uh, in agreement between the federal government and all the provinces, uh, and that's pretty standard right across the country. So that's a policy that's, that has been put in place for years as, as this program's a role, and to its basic function. So essential property to its basic function. And so essential property, you'll see that one of the issues is that, and I know that we have this in our area, uh, secondary residences. Um, is that essential? I would say for the average person, uh, a secondary resident is not essential. Therefore, it's not eligible under the disaster recovery program. Uh, basic function. TVs. If you lost a TV, you get $300. You can buy, I know I bought a TV from my place up in Edmonton for $300. Good TV. Isn't quite as nice as the one I have in my home in Calgary. Uh, but it's, it's it, I've got, you're, you're able to. So if you had the brand new uh, latest 80-inch LED TV uh, that cost you $10,000 to buy, you only get $300 to replace it. Uh, like I said, it's a social safety net. Uh, program that returns essential property to its basic function. Um, so the way that it works, the process, is municipalities would apply for a, dis a disaster recovery to the province on behalf of their residents uh, as a result of what they deem to be a disastrous event. Usually when they're in a local state of emergency, there's a likely chance that they will be applying. Uh, the province then approves the request and sets up a program uh, based on the following criteria. So this is why this is how we would approve the request. The event is considered extraordinary. Uh, insurance is not reasonably or readily available uh, for the event. And uh, there's evidence that the event is widespread. So, I mean, if it was just my street that flooded out in a downpour of rain, it's not likely to uh, uh, receive disaster recovery funds. But it's got to be widespread. Uh, and then the federal government then applies, once the, we put it together, a program in place, the federal government's contribution kicks in when the cost of those, uh, that program exceeds $1 per capita. And that's when the cost share uh, uh, kicks in. And again, these, these are uh, programs that have existed for a long, long time. Uh, you'll see that, as I mentioned, the Groneval report, some of his recommendations talk about making restrictions on disaster recovery programs. Those restrictions, uh, um, uh, were uh, in relation to um, <clears throat> particularly new developments and them not using best practices of mitigations if they're in flood hazard areas. And you'll see we're going to get to that because we start to, to make some decisions around that in, in future phases. Uh, and so residents, part of the process, you know, there's a, a huge, it's a very rigorous uh, program uh, with a lot of accountability. Uh, the federal government audits the program before they give money to the uh, provincial government. However, uh, because of the magnitude of this disaster being the largest financial disaster in history, the federal government has agreed to, 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 to provide us, and I don't know if they've made this public yet or not, but, uh, uh, but they have agreed to provide us an advance of $500 million, knowing that, uh, uh, that they're going to be on the hook for at least $500 million. It's the same reason why we approved $1 billion without seeing uh, really fast, without being able to do those processes and getting a real, because we know it's going to be well in excess of that, uh, and, uh, and uh, we want to get the, the money flowing. Uh, so, you know, this is the sort of process that residents have to go through uh, at the bottom there. Uh, <clears throat> eligible entities, there's programs for homeowners and tenants uh, under the Disaster Recovery Program programs for small business and landlords, programs for agricultural operations, not-for-profit organizations, institutions and condo associations, and for municipal governments to pay. And the types of support that it provides, uh, it would provide money or assistance for emergency food, and food uh, shelter and clothing, uh, restoration, replacement and repairs of individual dwellings, uh, cost of damage uh, inspection, uh, appraisal and cleanup, 
uh, removal of damaged structures that are a threat to public safety, uh, 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 repairs to public uh, infrastructure such as roads and bridges, and essential community services. So those are the types of things that this cover this program uh, uh, supports. Um, some of the challenges with the disaster recovery program in this large event that we were really struggling with, and, and, and the, the honest truth is that we still struggle with, uh, our, our capacity. Uh, the, you know, obviously the disaster recovery program is not a program that is a perpetual program within the, the government bureaucracy. It only kicks in when there's a, a, a significant natural disaster. Uh, and so you don't have a bunch of people sitting around doing nothing, just waiting for this to happen. Uh, so we actually contract out the delivery of, of this particular service. Uh, it mo usually most private companies can be a bit more flexible in, 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 in the cost to this and uh, in, in keeping the cost down. Um, the, the, the company that we've contracted out, there's, their track record of administrative costs through the actual payouts is quite good. It's actually well below the insurance industry standard for that. Um, and uh, uh, so what the, the, the company, uh, uh, which is a company called Landlink that does this for us, they had to go from 18 employees to 190. That's a lot of people to hire and train for a program that's very complex. Um, and uh, uh, some of the other challenges that we're having with the disaster recovery program is people are not getting the information they need to get in in order to be eligible for, to get money. And for example, one of the requirements is, is if you have a home that was damaged, you have to provide proof of ownership. Well, we have, uh, out of the, the 8,600 8, uh, claims or so, uh, a well over a thousand people that still have not provided us their proof of ownership of their of their their, uh, their resident, uh, and then obviously, like I said, this covers uninsurable losses. Sewer backup is an insurable uh, a lo uh, loss. So there are many instances where it's a combination of overland flooding and insur and insurance backup or uh, sewer backup, and that means that there has to be some sort of uh, uh, agreement between the insurance company as to what they're covered so that then the disaster recovery program can kick, kick in and cover the rest. So again, there's well over, well over 1,500 of the, the claims uh, that are outstanding still that we're still waiting to hear back from the insurance company as to whether they're covering and what they're covering. Uh, again, the challenge is, is people are waiting for their, the money to rebuild their lives uh, we need to find out what the insurance company is covering. Um, it just simply is very tough for us to justify saying, okay, well, we'll forward you the money uh, until the insurance company figures it out because it's very difficult and very onerous for us to be able to claw it back uh, if we've overpaid them. So it's, it's a challenge, and, and it's really a challenge between balancing uh, the uh, the victims, the interests of the victims of the flood and, and getting them moving forward and the, the general uh, population interest and the interest of taxpayers as far as accountability of the, the public funds that are being suspended. Um, some of the other policies, uh, we made uh, some policy decisions shortly after the flood that we believed that we had to make. Some of them were consistent with the direction of the Gronovall report uh, around uh, restrictions and standards and notations on, on property that are accessing the disaster recovery program. Essentially, there's two types of flood hazards in this province. There's a floodway and a flood fringe. The basic uh, difference between the two of them, a floodway is, is it's very high flowing water. Uh, it goes and it'll take out structures and it'll send them down. The problem with that is A, you, the damage is significant. It will, and I'm sure many of you have seen, seen videos of houses going down the river. Uh, and uh, uh, not only is it very expensive, now we're then on the hook to pay for that whole house the next time around uh, because it's completely gone, uh, or end this time around, but also there's a significant public safety issue around that. And uh, uh, the, the public safety issue is, is of, of uh, large concern for us as well uh, when it comes to this. Is, you know, as you get a house going down the river, in an emergency situation, if there's some 
people doing work down downstream, you can understand what a what a, dan a danger that is uh, to those people. Uh, and then the flood fringe is is you know the flooding just the, the flow isn't as well. You'll just you'll get some damage. Um, uh, the, the interesting thing is, is so we, we created a policy around the flood fringe is that any person that's accessing the disaster recovery program that is in, that is in a map area that says, pardon me, that you're in the floodway, we've created a buyout program for them. We're saying this, we're going to give them an option, we're not making them move out of there, but what we're saying is we will pay, the disaster recovery will pay for your uninsurable losses this time around. But if you, if you decide to take that and rebuild in the floodway, there will be a notation on your property that says you will no longer have access to disaster recovery program. Um, again, we want to encourage people to get out of there. We don't want to force them. We want to encourage them because we think that's the best policy from a, a future financial risk mitigation and from a future uh, public safety uh, uh, situation. And, and th so those people, uh, are able to then access uh, a program that will pay them their assessed value as to their last tax assessment for their house to move out instead of rebuild in that uh, area. Um, this is a policy that's not supported uh, according to a poll that was just released, not supported by, uh, by average Albertans. You can see close to three quarters of them don't support this policy uh, and uh, uh, well only 15% uh, do. And uh, uh, this is the, the this is the balance between good policy and good politics. Uh, our government is, is steadfast in this because we believe it's the absolute right thing to do for those reasons that I just indicated, and uh, we know but we know it's not very popular amongst the general population. Uh, and then uh, the, the the last thing is on the flood fringe. Uh, there's the ability for uh, people as if they live in a flood fringe, if they're accessing the disaster recovery program that they can access additional money above and beyond what it would be just to repair their house to where it is if they meet a standard that will allow their house to be more resilient in the event of future floods. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that standard, uh, again, a lot of work done on that standard. We've put some stuff out, had to take it back, readjust it. it. It has been a bit of an iterative process along the way. Try to get it out fast because as people want to start rebuilding their house in a week after the, the flood, they need to know these policies uh, because what we're saying is if you live in a flood fringe and you access the disaster recovery program but you don't do these mitigation to this very minimal standard, again you'll get a notation on your property saying you don't have access to the future disaster recovery program. And this isn't to prevent flooding from hitting their, their houses or their property, it's just to create better resiliency and that's what that standard is aimed at. Um, <clears throat> And then there's the erosion control program. These are pictures that just blow my mind. Uh, this is in Lackdays Arc, just uh, just a little bit uh, east of Canmore. Uh, this person was just about finished their house. It's now hanging over the edge of the river. Uh, that property went down a slope about uh, about 60 yards, uh, and it's now it, the, that river eroded 60 yards and about 40 feet up. Uh, this is a significant challenge. We're still working on decisions right now to deal with this group. We're hoping to have decisions uh, later. That's in Greg Creek. Uh, everybody saw what happened in Cougar Creek in, in Canmore. Uh, and this is in, in, in Exshaw. So you can see huge erosion of property. So not just flooding, but the actual erosion of property, the re-diversion, you know, the river, that's where the Bow River is now. It was 60 feet the other way. Uh, before the flood, so huge, huge impact, and, and we've we've created a, a what's called an erosion control program, uh, and uh, this was I was uh, announced this program. We've put started off 20 million. We've realized we've had to up it to 116 million. One of the things that we want to do is we're having it delivered through the uh, uh, municipalities because uh, there's a lot of considerations. Uh, these uh, we're coordinating through the municipalities because uh, there's a bunch of landowners that are involved. They all have sometimes very different interests when it comes to this. Uh, there's environmental approvals that are required if you're doing works on riverbanks and from either through uh, ESRD, uh, the provincial government or Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, uh, there's also a public safety, obviously that house there, 
uh, that's sitting over the edge is not very safe, uh, as well as there, there's work that's got to be done along those, these, those eroded riverbanks to do some short-term mitigation to make sure that we're protecting for potential flood events next year uh, before we can really get down to the long-term uh, mitigation projects. Um, the other thing, small businesses impacted. We made a couple uh, announcements on that. We did one of the things is uh, through the Alberta Chamber of Commerce, the uh, eligibility for disaster recovery for small businesses was you had to be in, uh, less than 20 employees. Uh, Alberta Chamber of Commerce wanted us to bump that between uh, 20 and, uh, and 50 employees uh, or to move it up to 50 employees. Uh, the federal government said they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to set that precedent uh, to pay for that. So we went ahead and made the policy decision anyways to do it knowing that the federal government will only pitch in part for those that are below 20 employees and those that are above 20 and 50 employees will be uh, and that access the program. All of those funds will come completely from the provincial government. Uh, and then we've also uh, uh, created a couple programs for businesses that need to bridge. The, the interesting thing is businesses have a lot more insurance options uh, than homeowners do. A lot do have the ability to get covered for some overland flooding uh, as part of their business insurance. But we have created a, a loan guarantee program where we've worked with the financial institutions uh, to allow businesses to restructure any debt uh, or take on more debt to get them through or brace them through their recovery phase. They can access up to a million dollars uh, um, uh, of which the province will guarantee 75% of that loan. Uh, this program, a lot of lessons learned from Slave Lake. We did this ourselves as a government uh, and uh, what we found that there was a very high level of default uh, on, on the loans and it ended up costing us money. Uh, we believe by having the financial institutions a skin in the game that we're not just going to prop, prop up businesses that were doomed to fail anyways that didn't have a good business model and probably wouldn't have survived anyways if they hadn't experienced the flood. As well as we've created a program that will allow us to cover the interest on those loans uh, for businesses for a period of time. So it's essentially a, a, what it amounts to, uh, two separate programs that amount to an access to an interest-free loan. Um, so where we're at, I, I don't want to run through these statistics. The, these, this was just released this week. Um, you can see, I'll, I might leave them up there for the questions because uh, I know that you know, I'm, I'm gone over. The last phase is the long-term <coughs> recovery, and we're not really in this stage yet. We're just starting to get to this stage, so I'm not really going to talk about decisions that we, we've made because we haven't really made a lot, but a lot of the long-term uh, 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 recovery is about you know, prevention and mitigation and how do we make sure that these communities are protected and able to move forward. So obviously we, uh, the Premier announced a community flood mitigation expert panel that was chaired by Alan Markin. A number of recommendations and projects coming forward. We're moving on that. We've hired a consulting engineer. They looked at about four or five major projects. Uh, that particularly deal with more the upstream prevention. When we take long-term uh, uh, mitigation, there's, there's essentially three lines of defense. We want to maybe pre prevent upstream from this amount of water getting, getting down so fast in such a short period of time. So we're talking retention dams, those types of things. Uh, then there's community protection so that if that water is coming, we have the dikes and berms in the right spots uh, to protect water from getting into uh, very vulnerable places and communities. Uh, and then the resiliency. So if the water does get, if a dike or a berm breaches, uh, do we have the infrastructure in place? Is it a better infrastructure? For example, in Bright Creek, we're going to invest in a modern uh, a water system, uh, weight, water and wastewater system, because frankly, the uh, old system of water wells and septic fields is, is not very resilient to flooding and causes huge uh, public health issues that are just in the long run, you just pay more and more to, to, to clean up. Uh, there is a, a flood mitigation symposium next Friday on October 4th where a bunch of stakeholders are coming together uh, to continue to move on, on that. Um, the number of considerations that you have to think about when uh, considering mitigation, environmental impacts, upstream and downstream consequences, climate variability and cost effectiveness. Uh, Again, there will be some legislative changes coming forward about prohib uh, prohibitation of development in floodways moving forward. Currently, legislation say municipalities uh, should not, meaning there's, it's recommended that you don't, but you can. 
Uh, that, uh, it, that will be changed this fall to shall not. It will be an outright prohibition in the MGA. Uh, as well as, uh, as a result, we'll probably need to do updated flood hazard mapping to find out where those floodways are so municipalities can make that decision as well as then to feed into where are the areas that we need to mitigate. Uh, so those are, those are some of the long-term uh, uh, things. Uh, obviously, there's been discussion around overland flood insurance uh, and, and whether that's appropriate or not appropriate. Uh, there's a number of examples where it does exist. Um, what I know is the areas that do exist, it's not particularly successful. A lot of those areas are, 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 are struggling uh, with keeping those financially sustainable, those programs. And then there will also be, as Minister Griffiths indicated, an independent review of everything from the initial response right through to all of the programs and policies that we put in place to make sure that we've learned the lessons uh, and we're able to better react uh, to these events in, in the future. And there will be lessons learned from that. 